I don't want to grow up, I'm a curious kid The world has a hundred questions I can play with So I'll open my arms and eyes And wonder every day till the day I die No one really knows why gravity exists Naming something does Now, let me welcome our speaker As I try to admit, latecomers, welcome latecomers Andrew Mayo, Andy Mayo is a PhD student and National Science Foundation graduate research fellow in the astronomy department at UC Berkeley. Go Bears. Andy earned his bachelor's degree in physics and astrophysics at Harvard. Then before coming to Cal, he earned a Fulbright fellowship and did postgraduate work at the University of Copenhagen. He also did work at the Technical University of Denmark. Andy may have reached the zenith of his young career in 2019 upon becoming a Wonderfest science envoy. Please welcome the astronomer who yearns to discover a twin Earth, astronomer Andy Mayo. Thank you very much, Tucker. It's an excellent introduction. And you are correct, today I will be talking all about exoplanets, the work that I do related to exoplanets. And near the end of my talk, I'll get a little into how we might find alien life. So I will jump right into the talk. First of all, I just wanna clear up a definition. When we talk about exoplanets, we're talking about planets that are outside of our solar system, which means that every planet in the universe, except for eight planets, are all exoplanets. So the beginning of our story could be traced all the way back to 1584, when an Italian monk by the name of Giordano Bruno made the following statement. He claimed that in space there are countless constellations, suns and planets. We see only the suns because they give light. The planets remain invisible, for they are small and dark. There are also numberless Earths circling around their suns. Now, back in 1584, this was a very controversial idea. If you would like to learn more about Giordano Bruno, I encourage you to look him up. But I'll simply say that there was no evidence at the time that Giordano Bruno was correct. However, over the intervening centuries, it's been proven that he was in fact right on the money. The modern day story of exoplanets skips forward a few hundred years, all the way to 1992. In 1992, a paper came out reporting the first discovery of any kind of exoplanet ever. So you see here a paper about planets found around a pulsar. Now I wanna talk a little bit about what the a pulsar is and I believe that I should have my sound up so that you can all listen in. So I have a video here that will briefly describe what a pulsar is, and then we'll talk about what these planets were like. A pulsar is a rapidly spinning neutron star, which is the small, incredibly dense remnant of a much more massive star. A teaspoon of matter from a neutron star weighs as much as Mount Everest, and a neutron star is so compact that a ball about 15 miles across contains more matter than our sun. Okay, so a pulsar is a very unusual object. It is one of the things that can happen to a star when it dies. Other than going supernova or turning into a black hole, it could also become a pulsar. And by looking at these flashes of light coming from a pulsar, astronomers were able to see small variations in these flashes of light from the pulsar. And from that, we're able to deduce that there were planets orbiting. But a pulsar is the dead remnant of a star. It's not like stars like the sun. It's not a very normal kind of star. It's like the aftermath of a star. It wouldn't be for a few more years until 1995 that the next planet would be found. But to go into detail about that, I have to tell you about one of the most common methods of finding a planet. That is the radial velocity method. The radial velocity method is sometimes more colloquially referred to as the wobble method. What is done with the radial velocity method is astronomers make use of 
the Doppler effect, which most people in everyday experience know as that thing that makes the ambulance sound really weird as it passes by. You've always heard it before where an ambulance will go by and it sounds like, why does it do that? As the ambulance is coming toward you, the sound is being compressed together. And so you get a very high pitch sound. As it passes you and goes away, all of the sound being emitted is now stretched out. And so the pitch gets much lower. And so it sounds like as it goes by. That's for sound waves, but that exact same effect, the Doppler effect is also something that you see in light waves. If an object moves toward you, those light waves get compressed together. They actually become a little bit more blue. And then when an object moves away from you, the light waves being emitted by that object get stretched out a little bit. They become more red. So if you look at a star and you look at whether the light is being compressed or stretched, you can measure how fast the star is moving toward you and away from you. And I'll demonstrate here now. So you see in this diagram, we have a star being pushed and pulled by a planet as the planet orbits. And as this planet tugs, the star moves away and then moves toward the observer. And you can see that here's a little diagram of the light that's being emitted by the star. So you see that it gets stretched out and compressed and stretched out and compressed. So it goes from blue to red to blue to red, very, very slightly. It's not the kind of effect that you and I could observe with our naked eye, but it is the kind of thing that with very sensitive instruments an astronomer can detect. So if an astronomer measures the speed of this star toward and away over time with this Doppler effect, and they see that the star is moving toward you and away from you back and forth and back and forth, that tells us that there might be a planet which is pushing and pulling. And from that observation, you can measure the mass of the planet. You can see how long it takes for the planet to orbit the star once, and you can get a firm detection that you have found a planet. And indeed, this is what happened in 1995. The very first planet to be found around a normal star, not a pulsar, but a normal main sequence star, a star that's just burning hydrogen, doing its regular thing like our sun. And this planet was called 51 Pegasi b. 51 Pegasi b orbits its host star once every four days. That is very, very, very fast. For context, Mercury orbits our sun once roughly every 80 days. And Jupiter in our system takes, I believe, 11 years to orbit our sun. So there's nothing like this planet in our own solar system. And because it orbits so quickly and it's so close to its host star, it's also extremely hot. If you were on the surface of 51 Pegasi b, or surface, the size of Jupiter, so there's not much surface to speak of. If you were near 51 Pegasi b, it would be hot enough to melt lead. So the reason I say all this is to point out that this planet is nothing like what we see in our own solar system. It's completely different. But I'll also show you how we were able to find it. The radial velocity method, we're looking for this wobble back and forth. And in fact, this is what the data looked like. You see this very clean, nice looking wobble back and forth. The star moves away, the star moves toward, the star moves away, back and forth and back and forth. And that's how this first planet was found. For the next few years, a couple of additional planets were found with the same method. But as it turns out, nowadays, the radial velocity method has proven to be the second most common method of finding an exoplanet. The first most common method was not actually employed at all until four years after 51 Pegasi b in 1999. This method is the transit method. The transit method I think is much conceptually simpler than the radial velocity method. Essentially, the exoplanet transit method is when you look for the shadow of a planet. When a planet crosses in front of its star, it casts a shadow, which we see as a small dip in light from the star. And as the planet orbits and comes back around, then it transits again, you see another dip. Then again, it comes back around and transits again, you see another dip. And over time, you see these small dips coming from this star. 
But another thing to notice is that if you have a very small planet, you have a very shallow, very small dip. And if you have a very large planet, you get a much deeper dip. So this actually allows us to look at a different aspect of the exoplanet. While with the radial velocity method, the wobble of the star back and forth tells us about how heavy the planet is, the mass of the planet. The transit method lets us learn about the radius or the diameter of the planet, the size. And a small planet with a lot of mass, very high density. Whereas a very large planet with very little mass, very low density. So these two different methods are used sometimes in conjunction. They're used at the same time on the same system. That allows us to learn about the mass and the radius of the planet. And then we can start learning about the density or even the composition of the planet. But the very first time this was used was in 1999. Oh, there's one other thing that I wanna note. Um, when a planet transits, it only transits because it just happens to be aligned with our, with our frame of reference. Uh, if the planet orbits up like this, and here's the star, it may never transit from our perspective. So we only see a small fraction of the planets that are out there with the transit method, but it does give us different information from the radial velocity method. So just noting that the first time this method was used was in 1999, four years after the radial velocity method was first used. Here we see what the actual data looked like. You see that on September 9th, 1999, the star doing its normal thing. And then all of a sudden, whoa, it gets dimmer and it stays dim for a while, a couple hours. And then it gets brighter again, it's back to normal. And then a week later, this data is offset. It's not dimmer, but a week later, the star is doing its normal thing. Wow, it gets, it gets dim again, and then it comes back. That was the first transit of an exoplanet that was ever found. And that really started to open the floodgates, so to say, for planets, because it's much easier to observe a single transit of a planet than to measure the velocity of the star over days and days and days and days and days. So it's much easier to find a planet with the transit method if the planet happens to be lined up with us. So that brings us to 2009, skipping forward a decade to what is arguably the most important space mission in the history of exoplanets. It's a very short history, I'll grant you that. But in 2009, the Kepler mission was launched. The Kepler mission was this Kepler probe, which was launched into space with one single objective, which was to look at a single patch of sky and do nothing else for four years straight. And its job was to look for exoplanet transits in that patch of sky. And in fact, everyone at home can do an exercise. If you all hold out your hand, your outstretched hand, if you were to go outside and hold that outstretched hand up to the night sky, that is about how much of the night sky the Kepler mission looked at. It's actually a very, very small portion of the sky. I believe it's about one four hundredth of the night sky. That's the only part of the sky that the Kepler mission looked at, but it looked at nothing else and just that patch for four years straight. Its goal in looking for all of these planets in this patch of sky was, quote, determine the frequency of terrestrial and larger planets in or near the habitable zone of a wide variety of spectral types of stars, which is a mouthful. Basically, the Kepler mission was designed to figure out how common planets like the Earth are. And that's why I wanna focus in on one term in this mission objective, specifically the habitable zone. The habitable zone is an extremely important uh, idea in the field of exoplanets. Also, coincidentally, my background is the exact same as the uh, image that I'm using here. Uh, <laughs> uh, it demonstrates very nicely how the habitable zone works. Essentially, there is an inner region where if a planet is orbiting a star, it's just too hot for there to be life of any kind. And much further out, it's much too cold for there to be life of any kind. But specifically, the way that the habitable zone is defined is with water. So the 
actual definition of the habitable zone is the region around a star where an orbiting planet could have liquid water on the surface. So in that region, if it's too close, the water will evaporate, all of it. And if the planet is much further away, the planet will have, if it has water, it will freeze. In this middle region, you can have water that sits comfortably. That's why this is sometimes also called the Goldilocks zone. So just to talk about this a little bit further, it's sort of like being at a campfire when you're trying to roast marshmallows. If you're sitting way too close to the campfire, you're gonna get burned. And if you're sitting way too far away from the campfire, you're not gonna be able to roast your marshmallow. But if you're at just the right distance, the Goldilocks zone, the habitable zone, you'll be able to roast your marshmallow and sit very comfortably, warm, not hot, not cold, warm. So that's the idea of the habitable zone. So now I wanna talk a little bit about how successful the Kepler mission was. The Kepler mission found almost 5,000 exoplanet candidates, 4,717 candidates. And of those, almost 2,400 have now been confirmed planets. When you find a planet candidate, you're not sure whether it's a planet or not. It could be a signal of some other kind. 2,400 or so planets have been followed up in more detail and have been confirmed to be actual planets. One of those is a planet that I published a paper on in 2019. The name of that planet was Kepler 538b. Very fancy name, I know. And that's just one of hundreds and hundreds of other papers that have been published based on Kepler results. Now, out of those, 361 planets are in their star's habitable zone, which means these planets are not too close and not too far away. But there's one other thing that's important when you're talking about whether a planet could have liquid water on the surface of it, which is whether or not it actually has a surface. If you're talking about a very, very large planet like Jupiter, Jupiter doesn't really have a surface per se. If you were to try and land on Jupiter, you would fall through an atmosphere that would get thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker until eventually the pressure would get so high that it would crush you. And you would never find a surface that you could stand and walk on. It just sort of goes from atmosphere to like thicker atmosphere till it sort of turns to like a weird liquid. And then maybe deep down there's some kind of core, but you can't walk on it. So for a planet in the habitable zone, the planets that we might actually care about in terms of life need to also be rocky. They need to have a surface like the Earth or like Mars or like Venus or like Mercury. So out of these 361 planets, there were 60 planets that were still habitable and also potentially rocky, which means they're small enough that they might have a surface that you could walk on. Why did I go through all of these numbers and break all of this down for you? Well, essentially because the big lesson that we learned from the Kepler mission is that Earth-like planets are everywhere. We now know that very roughly one in 10 or one in 100 planets, we don't have the number precisely pinned down, but roughly in that range, roughly one in 10 or 100 stars will have an Earth-like planet in the habitable zone of that star. Not just habitable, but the right size that it could be rocky as well. And before the Kepler mission, we didn't know what that number was. It could have been one in a million. Maybe Earth was super, super special. But now we know that it's probably a very common type of planet. And that was a very important finding from the Kepler mission. So now going on from Kepler, we're gonna talk about another mission that came after that in 2013, the K2 mission. For those of you who have a keen eye, you may notice something funny here, which is that the K2 probe here looks suspiciously similar to the Kepler probe. And that's because it's actually the exact same probe. So what happened was in 2013, the Kepler mission having just finished its primary mission actually suffered a malfunction, a serious problem. One of the reaction wheels, a device that helped keep the Kepler probe looking at that one patch of sky broke. Because that wheel broke, the probe was not able to keep looking at that one patch of sky any longer. But astronomers and engineers got together and they came up with a very clever fix where the Kepler probe could no longer look at that patch of sky any longer, but 
could look at other patches of sky for shorter periods of time. And so the mission was rebranded as K2. And you see here that it looked at different small patches of sky, each of these being the size of the Kepler field, but only being observed for 75 or 80 days at a time, not four years. But this was still very useful for a lot of reasons. One, K2 was able to look at a lot more of the night sky. And two, it was able to find planets around very bright stars. If you look at a lot of different patches of night sky, you're gonna be looking at a lot of bright stars. And you're gonna find planets around those bright stars because the brighter the planet, the brighter the star is, the more photons that you get in your telescope, the easier it is to get really clean, good data. So it's easier to find planets. So they found, K2 found a lot of planets around very bright stars. The only downside to K2 is that it was not able to view each of these fields for nearly as long. And as a result, it wasn't able to find planets that had very, very long orbital periods. If a planet orbits its star once every year, like the Earth, then the odds of seeing it transit during the 70 days that the K2 mission is looking at it are pretty slim. And so K2 tended to find planets that orbited their stars much, much faster, whereas Kepler found much, much longer orbital period planets. I'll also interject here with another fun fact, which is there have been approximately 400 planets that have been confirmed to, be, to have been found with K2, um, about 1,400 candidates, and of those, about 400 that have been confirmed. Uh, and a planet mission, sorry, a paper that I wrote in 2018 uh, was able to include 95 of those planets. So that's the largest paper that I've done to date, but approximately one quarter of the planets that have been confirmed with K2 were confirmed through the work that I did in 2018. So I was very happy and proud to be part of that work. And I look forward to doing more work along those lines. So now we're going to move on from Kepler and K2 to the next mission. In fact, the currently ongoing mission, which is called TESS. You can see here a very cute little graphic of Kepler K2 <laughs> handing off the planet torch to TESS. TESS stands for the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. And the goal of TESS is broadly similar to Kepler and K2, but it operates quite differently. So I'll go a little bit into detail about TESS here. We have a short video that I'd like to talk a little bit from. So I'm gonna play this and let everyone listen. It will break down a little bit of how TESS operates. Each of TESS's cameras has a 16.8 megapixel sensor covering a square 24 degrees wide, large enough to contain an entire constellation. TESS has four of these cameras arranged to view a long strip of the sky called an observation sector. TESS will watch each observation sector for about 27 days before rotating to the next. It will cover the southern sky in its first year and then begin scanning the north. TESS will study 85% of the sky an area 350 times greater than what NASA's Kepler mission first observed. So I actually want to pull that up right here and pause it for a second, because this really demonstrates the strength of TESS. Whereas Kepler looked at one small patch of sky, and then K2 looked at approximately 20 patches of sky the same size, they never looked at a majority of the night sky. TESS is looking at almost the entire night sky which means that we finally get a full sky survey of where exoplanets might be. And so that is very important for reasons that will become clear in the next slide. So the great thing about TESS is that it's finding very, very bright stars that host planets. And those stars are gonna be great targets to follow up with the next telescope that I wanna talk about. This is the James Webb Space Telescope. So the James Webb Space Telescope is meant to be the successor to Hubble. And it's scheduled to launch, I believe, Halloween of this year. October 31st of 2021 is the currently scheduled launch date. And it's going to be able to do a lot of awesome science for the entire astronomical community, but also specifically for the exoplanet community. So 
it's going to be able to do a lot of really cool follow-up observations once these planets have been found with TESS. So I'm actually doing some work currently with TESS that will fold over into James Webb eventually. I submitted a proposal last year for the third year of TESS observations. And I also submitted a similar proposal last week, in fact, for uh, more observations for year four of TESS in order to look at, in the first proposal, about 900 systems. And in the second proposal, about 2000 systems in order to look at these systems where we already have already, sorry, where we've found a planet or planet candidate and look for additional observations to see if there might be other planets on top of that one planet, siblings. These discoveries the tests will make if these stars are bright enough will fold over into James Webb and allow us to do something very, very interesting called atmospheric characterization, which is a very fancy word for learning about the atmosphere of a planet. What is in the atmosphere? What's it made of? So I have another video here that describes better than I could exactly how this process works. I will play this through and then summarize a little bit of it afterwards to tell you exactly how atmospheric characterization works and how James Webb will do this. So how do we use a telescope to read transit light? Stars emit light at many wavelengths. Like a prism makes a rainbow, we can separate light into its separate wavelengths. This is called a spectrum. Visible light appears to our eyes as the colors of the rainbow, but beyond visible light, there are many wavelengths we cannot see. Now back to the transiting planet. As light is traveling through the planet's atmosphere, some wavelengths get absorbed. Which wavelengths get absorbed depends on which molecules are in the planet's atmosphere. For example, carbon monoxide molecules will capture different wavelengths than water vapor molecules. So when we look at that planet in front of the star, some of the wavelengths of the starlight will be missing, depending on which molecules are in the atmosphere of the planet. Learning about the atmospheres of other worlds is how we identify those that could potentially support life. Yeah, so essentially the atmospheric characterization method here, which is called transmission spectroscopy, allows us to look for fingerprints of different molecules in the atmosphere of a planet. And by looking at which wavelengths of light get through the planet's atmosphere and which ones are blocked, we can build up a picture of what kinds of molecules are in the atmosphere. And that's very important when we're trying to learn about life on other planets because the presence of life actually changes the atmosphere. I'll go into that in a little more detail in a minute or two but just keep that in mind. Life affects a planet's atmosphere. One thing I also wanna mention is that this exact process is something that I'm really excited for the opportunity to do firsthand. In just last November, the James Webb Space Telescope uh, was requesting proposals to be submitted for just this process along with other uh, ideas. And my research group and I submitted a proposal in order to do this exact thing in order to learn about the atmosphere of one planet in particular to learn about what kinds of molecules are in its atmosphere. So fingers crossed, I might find out whether I have an accepted proposal to do this exact work in a few months. And then it would still take two or three more years to actually get the data, but it takes a very long time to do science correctly. The reason that we care so much about a planet's atmosphere is because habitable, to be in the habitable zone, is not the same as actually habitable. Here we see the solar system, our eight planets, and right here we see Earth. There's something unusual about the solar system here. We see the habitable zone plotted out, and there's something funny here, Mars. Mars is in the habitable zone? Let's think about this for a second. Mars is in the habitable zone, which means it could have liquid water on the surface of the planet, hypothetically. And in fact, actually, I believe a year or two ago, there was uh, a new report that during some times of the year, there actually is a little bit of liquid water on the surface of Mars temporarily. But there are no oceans. The atmosphere is almost non-existent. 
you and I would not want to take a stroll on a sunny day on Mars. It would not go very well for us. We have to have a suit, an astronaut suit to survive on Mars. So Mars is habitable, but it's not really that habitable in the normal sense of the word. And that's why we care about learning about what's in a planet's atmosphere. Because once we've found that the planet is small enough to be rocky and it's at the right distance that it could have liquid water, the next questions are going to be, okay, well, does it have liquid water? Is it actually habitable like Earth? Could we actually walk on the surface? Is it, does it have breathable air? Those kinds of questions you can only answer once you start learning about the planet's atmosphere. So we've talked about how we might be able to do that with the James Webb Space Telescope, but there's one more mission that I wanna talk about that will use a method called direct imaging. Direct imaging is the last method of finding a planet that we're gonna talk about tonight. And the idea of direct imaging is very simple. Direct imaging is directly imaging a planet. Here we see a real planetary system where you might ask yourself, well, where is the star? And the answer is the star is there. Ooh, spoilers. <laughs> the star is there, but we've blocked out the light from the star. Imagine that you wanted to look at the light from a firefly, but that firefly was right next to a car's headlight. You wouldn't be able to see the firefly. There would be no chance. The light from the headlight from the car would totally swamp it out. But if you held out your thumb and blocked out the light from the car's headlight, blocked it out just right, you might be able to see smaller lights nearby, like the light from that firefly. That's exactly what this process is. If you can block out the light from the sun, then you can start to see other faint things nearby, like planets. And that is the proposed method of looking at planets' atmospheres for the last mission that I'm going to talk about. This is called Louvoir. So the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be the successor to Hubble, but everything gets old and breaks down and eventually James Webb is going to get old and break down as well. We don't know when, but it's going to happen. So there are already proposals and ideas for what's going to come after James Webb. And one of those proposals is the large ultraviolet optical infrared telescope, the Louvoir telescope. It's a very contorted acronym. If Louvoir were to be accepted as a mission, it's only a proposal right now, but if it were to be accepted as a mission, it would be a 15 meter piece of glass, a telescope in space. 15 meters is truly, truly, truly enormous. That's about 50 feet. That would be about six or seven cars stacked end to end. It would be hundreds of times more collecting power than Hubble, dozens of times more collecting power than the James Webb Space Telescope. It would be unlike anything that we've ever seen in space before. And if everything went off without a hitch, it would probably launch in the late 2030s. What it would be able to do is it would have an instrument on board called a coronagraph, which does just like I said with my thumb blocking out the headlight, except it's a very sophisticated instrument that acts like that thumb that blocks the light out. A coronagraph would block the light of a star and allow you to see planets nearby. So the next slide I'm gonna show you is actually a simulation of that. There was a simulation that was done with what Louvoir might actually look like if we were to look at a planetary system 40 light years away from us, and there were to be a twin setup, you know, a sun just like our sun, all of the solar system planets, just like our solar system planets, but 40 light years away. And then we put Louvoir in space and looked at that system. I will show you what we would see. This is what it would look like. You see that near the outer edge of what Louvoir could see, a very, very bright signal from Jupiter. At the very inner edge of what we would be able to see, Venus. The sun is blocked out. And then right over here, there it is pale blue dot called Earth. Obviously this would be an Earth twin, it would be an Earth duplicate, but a planet like Earth orbiting a sun like our own at the right distance, very easy to detect with a telescope like Louvoir. Right now with James Webb, we're not going to be able to get quite down to that level. So we're going to have to wait for the next telescope, something like Louvoir to be able to find an Earth twin and get light directly from the planet. And that, cuts out 
all of that complicated business with looking at a planet's atmosphere by looking at the light that passes through the planet's atmosphere. That's what we're doing right now with planets that transit in front of their stars. With this direct imaging method and with a telescope like Louvoir, we could just look at the light directly from the planet and we would have a spectrum of light and be able to look at the atmosphere of the planet directly without any middle men, nothing else. Just there it is, the atmosphere. And I would show you right now, I'll show you right now what that might look like. What you're seeing right here is a spectrum that we might get if we looked at an Earth twin with Louvoir. And these different letters here are indicators of different molecules. H2O, that's water vapor. This little feature right here in wavelength versus the brightness of the star or the planet, this dip means that water vapor is absorbing a lot of light in this wavelength. And also here, and also here, and also here. Water vapor, water vapor, water vapor, water vapor. Other things like oxygen would be visible here. And then with more detail, you could find even further signals as well. Now, remember what I said a couple of slides back, life affects a planet's atmosphere. On planet Earth, the atmosphere is about 20% oxygen. That is not what it would be if there were not life on planet Earth. Without life on planet Earth, the amount of oxygen on Earth would be hundreds of times less than that, which means oxygen is what's called a biosignature. Biosignature is anything in a planet's atmosphere that points towards life. Oxygen is a biosignature. Ozone is a biosignature. Methane is a biosignature. There are a lot of different biosignatures. And if you can get a very high quality spectrum at different wavelengths, what's in the atmosphere, you can learn about different molecules that are in a planet's atmosphere and see how many of those biosignatures are there. If you just see one or maybe even two, maybe something that wasn't life could cause it. But if you see a whole laundry list of biosignatures, all of them are normally caused by life on earth and there's no other way to cause them. Now you're starting to think, I don't see how I could make that without having life. And so that is, I believe, how we are going to find life elsewhere in the universe. I think that in the next couple decades, we're going to be able to get more and more sophisticated instruments and telescopes, maybe something like Louvoir, that will be able to start looking at the atmospheres of rocky habitable planets and start to see whether we see signs of life as we know it, or maybe life unlike anything we've seen before. And as we build up a database of more and more planets, we'll get a better and better picture of what other planets are like and find out whether any other planets are not just habitable, but inhabited. So that is my talk on exoplanets and the search for alien life. I've left up an amusing comic about exoplanet astronomers. And lastly, I just want to thank all of you for coming to this talk. I hope you enjoyed it. And I would be very happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you. Great, Andy. Thank you. Uh, I've just corrected a mistake that I made at the beginning of this um, great talk and at the beginning of the previous talk, which I have <laughs> restored our wonder knots, our visitors ability, our audience ability to show themselves on their camera on their, from their webcam view and to unmute themselves. I apologize for not doing that sooner, but it's available now. And that means you can ask the question, ask questions in either of the approaches, using either of the approaches I recommended, either boldly asking the question yourself by unmuting yourself and, uh, and asking and then remuting, or by typing it in the chat. And let's start with a couple of questions already posted in the chat. Thank you to you very, you wonder knots who have uh, been brave enough to type those in there throughout the talk. Question from Amir Khan, Andrew, is there any relationship between the beams of radiation coming out of a pulsar and the black body radiation, also known as Hawking radiation, emitted from a black hole? That is a great question. So pulsars and black holes are not my area of expertise. So anything I say, you'll wanna take with a grain of salt, but 
pulsars are the remnants of stars that weren't quite massive enough to collapse into a black hole. Pulsars emit a great deal of light like a normal star. So I think that the pulses of light and also the normal light from the pulsar are mostly like light from our own sun and less like anything like Hawking radiation, which is a very eccentric, esoteric, and harder to understand thing. They both are a form of radiation, um, but beyond that, I think the connection is pretty tenuous. All right, thanks, Andy. Lorraine Yamaguchi asks a question also about that first discovery. Is there a reason why the first exoplanet was discovered around a pulsar? Ah, so the first exoplanet was found around a pulsar, mostly on accident. So around the 90s, people did not think that we would be able to find planets around other stars yet because we thought that all other systems were just like our own. And if you try to apply the transit method or the radial velocity method to other systems that have planets like our own with small planets near and then large planets further away, the 90s just weren't able to do that yet. Uh, but we were wrong about the variety of exoplanets that are out there. It turns out we were able to find planets. We just weren't looking for them yet. So the pulsar, People noticed that these pulses were not coming when we expected them to. That was because the pulsars were being pushed and pulled by these planets. And so they were in a different location and emitting these pulses. And then those pulses had to travel a little bit further or a little less far to reach us. And we were seeing that in a delay in time from these pulses. So that was mostly an accident because we just didn't know that we could find planets yet until we really started looking for them in the mid and late 90s. Cool, okay. Um, Leigh Martin asks, regarding that cool picture you had of Louvoir, what is the large flat panel on the bottom of Louvoir? Is it shielding or maybe solar panels suggests Adam Borgensen? Let me see if I can find it again. Down here, yeah. So that is, um, that is solar panels. I'm pretty confident it's solar panels. Uh, it would also help block the light from the sun. You don't want the glare from the sun accidentally getting in the telescope that causes a lot of issues. So it would also be partially shielding the telescope itself from the sun, but I believe its primary objective is to collect light as a solar panel. It's cool that the, the wonder knots that Pose this question offered great possible solutions. It turns out both are true, shielding mm -hmm. and uh, solar power. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see. Um, Eric Yao asks, given that there are moons around Jupiter that contain significant amounts of water, shouldn't we expect perhaps many other potential worlds outside the Goldilocks zone that would be candidates for life? The short answer to that is absolutely yes. A slightly longer answer is first, we are very interested in these moons that have water around Jupiter and Saturn. In fact, there are missions being proposed right now to go and investigate them in more detail. Uh, two, where there's water, there's life, at least as we've seen on earth. So it could be that anywhere where there's water, including underneath ice on a moon of Jupiter, you'll find life and we just don't know yet. Uh, and three, there may be places elsewhere in the universe where life forms um, like under the surface of a moon in an ocean under the ice, but we do know one place where life has definitely formed and that's the earth, which means that when we go out looking for life elsewhere in the universe, we try to find things that are as similar to earth as possible. And that's not coming from a place of like, egocentrism, like we're the most important. It's just that we're making fewer assumptions about the kind of life we're looking for because maybe life needs enough sunlight, in which case looking under the ocean on a moon, we wouldn't find any. Or maybe life needs to have a rocky surface, in which case there's no point looking at gas giants. We're not sure which things about earth are necessary for life and which ones are coincidental. So we don't wanna make too many gambles and look at some very strange thing 
where there's a very low chance of life, or at least we want to hedge our bets, look a little bit at that, but look a lot more at rocky habitable Earth-sized planets. Thank you, Andy. I mentioned that that question came from a gent named Eric Yao. Uh, many of us appreciate Eric's work because he produces the videos from Wonderfest, and that means that this video will be viewable in a week or two at the Wonderfest Science YouTube channel. So Eric, hail to you, and thanks for the good question. Thank you, Eric. Here's a question. By the way, there was a brave hand raised over in the participants bar, somebody who wanted to ask a question audibly. Uh, I just asked him to unmute. You're unmuted. Hi, Hello. can you hear me now? Yes, yes. we can. Hi, hi, I'm here with uh, no. with, no. with uh, my, my son and his girlfriend. Um, so really enjoyed the, uh, the lecture, uh, Dr. Mayo, very much. Um, uh, recently, I heard in the news, I believe, uh, that uh, a gas uh, that indicates life was identified in the atmosphere of Venus. And mm. so I'm wondering if that's what you were referring to when you're talking about the Louvoir and could that um, kind of detection be done using the James Webb uh, telescope? Thank you very much. That's a great question. So the detection of, I'll, I'll summarize this very shortly. There's a lot of contention about that. The discovery was of a molecule called phosphine, which is something that is hard to produce without life, but it's not concrete 100% evidence of life and the detection itself has been debated. So phosphine may or may not be in the atmosphere of Venus. And if it is, it doesn't mean that there's life necessarily. What we need to do is do a lot more observations to learn more about it. Right now, I would not be comfortable saying there's life on Venus from that result, but it's certainly intriguing enough that we want to do more research on it. As for James Webb, James Webb would be only designed to look at things, I believe, I won't say, actually, I won't say that. Maybe James Webb will look at things like Venus, but James Webb, I actually don't think so. James Webb is not able to look at things that are too bright, actually. If you look at something too bright and Venus is very, very bright, you actually saturate the instrument and so you just get nonsense results. So I think most solar system objects, unless they're like asteroids or like Kuiper Belt objects really far out, are just not going to be observable to James Webb and you'll have to use other instruments. But those kinds of questions, looking at the atmosphere of a planet, that's something that James Webb is designed to do, just not Venus in particular, I don't believe. Great, thank you much, thank you. Thanks for the question, Stuart. Adrian Ogden asks, is magnetic, sorry, yeah, is magnetic lensing, perhaps, perhaps, Adrian means gravitational, but he asks, is magnetic lensing using the sun a viable method to image planets, placing a telescope way out in space? Uh, yeah, I believe he does mean micro lensing. Hmm. So <laughs> it's funny you mentioned this. There is a wild paper out there and I am sorry that I cannot remember the name, but it is this crazy idea of actually doing exactly that which is as light passes by an object, it is bent slightly. And so in space, sometimes when two objects line up, there's a gravitational lensing effect. And that's uh, another method of actually finding planets called microlensing. But this idea would be, say we found a planet like two stars over and we think there might be life there, but we want to look at it in great detail. We could actually send a probe in the opposite direction about 400 to 600 or so times further away from the sun than the earth is from the sun. It would take decades. And then it would turn back around and the sun would be directly between it and its target. It would only be able to look at one target, but the light from the target would pass around the sun and get bent ever so slightly. And then the probe would look at it and you would actually be able, hypothetically, the, the physics is there, you would be able to gather a high definition photo of the surface of that planet. It would be that good. But this is a wild, wild idea. And it's only something that some, I've only ever seen one person propose it. They did the math, it seemed to bear out, but it would still take 
next generation technology and still take decades and decades to do. But the science behind the question is definitely there. And whether or not something like that ever comes to fruition, I don't know, but it is hypothetically possible. Cool. All right, we have a question from Bruce, Bruce Friedberg, and he's going to ask it himself. Please unmute yourself, Bruce. Okay, can you hear me? Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay, Tucker and Andrew, thank you very much. Um, my question is for the, for the um, observations of things that are initially identified as candidates, but then subsequently don't get confirmed as exoplanets, is there a common phenomenon or a common reason why most of these things are initially candidates, but then they're not confirmed? That's a great question. There are a couple of reasons why things that appear to be planets and are marked as candidates may not turn out to be planets. The most common one is that you're actually looking at two stars called an eclipsing binary. If you have one star orbiting from another star, that also creates a dip in light. It's a much, much larger dip, but say that it only grazes and you get a very shallow dip. That grazing transit, that grazing eclipse could be confused for a transit. Or you could have a very deep dip, but there's also another star nearby and they're all so close together that you can't actually tell them apart from one another. And that other background star sort of washes out this really deep transit so it looks shallower. And those three stars could masquerade as a transit or you could have the star just has a period cycle where it's got maybe some star spots on the surface and it rotates every say 20 days, for example. And that could potentially look like it might be a, a planet. And then another possibility is that it's just bad luck. It could be when you have just noise from your instrument, it's just a scatter, maybe a couple data points in a row happen to be abnormally low. And then 20 days later that happened again. And then 20 days later that happened again. And that's just bad luck. And sometimes you just get unlucky. And then additionally, there are uh, aliases. There are periodic signals due to the fact that your probe has time periods on which it operates. The Kepler probe orbited the sun uh, once every 360 days. It was in an earth trailing orbit. So it moved further and further away from us each year. So there were a lot of signals that cropped up around 360 days because it just happened to have a, sig there just happened to be things that happened on that time scale with the instrument as it orbited the sun and those signals, you had to take very careful care to make sure that the instrument was being accounted for. Those are a lot of different ways that signals can sneak in and confuse you and look like a planet when it's not a planet. Excellent. Michael Holliday, a wonder not, asks, are you only looking at stars or perhaps are the various probes investigate doing the investigation? Are you only looking at stars like our sun or all types of stars? That is an excellent question. The most important thing about a star, whether or not we want to look at it, is how bright it is. Um, and that's a function of the type of star it is, but also how far away it is. But there are very few stars that we are unable to look at or don't want to bother looking at. Um, stars that have left the main sequence, things like pulsars are interesting in their own right, but people don't care to look for planets orbiting them very often. Uh, other things that uh, stars turn into are called white dwarfs. There's a little bit of interest for those. That's like a subfield, um, but that's a separate question. There are some stars that are so large, you know, maybe five times larger than the sun or more, where they're so big that they just drown out the signal from a potential planet. And so there's not a lot of interest in those stars either. But that's a very, very small fraction of the stars out there. Most stars from the very, very smallest stars to a couple of times larger than the sun, they're all fair game. We've found planets around stars ranging up to about, I think four or five times larger than the sun. Larger than that, it gets really, really hard. And once stars finish burning hydrogen and leave the main sequence and become stellar remnants like neutron stars or white dwarfs, that also becomes tricky in different ways. Ted Least asks, is our notion of habitability changing with the increasing emergence of hmm. extremophiles, maybe in particular extremophile bacteria? Yeah. So for everyone who doesn't know what an extremophile is, an extremophile is something that loves the extreme, extremophile. It's some kind of life 
that can exist in a very unusual environment. Intense heat, intense cold. And when I mean intense, I mean boiling or like sub sub zero. Um, acid, like high levels of pH or extremely basic on the opposite end. There are certain types of, of creatures that can survive in the vacuum of space or high levels of radiation. All of those are classified as extremophiles. Extremophiles are a very important aspect of astrobiology, studying what kinds of life could be out there. The big question that people don't have an answer to is, are those kinds of life, life that forms after life forms in a very easy way and then it fills those niches later? Or could life form in those extremely difficult environments? We don't know the answer to that, but our definition of habitability versus our definition of the habitable zone are two very, very different things. The habitable zone is almost a misnomer at this point. It's just a placeholder name for region where liquid water could exist. But beyond that, our definition of habitability is very wide ranging. We don't know what kinds of environment life could actually exist in, in other systems because we haven't found life in other systems. So it's a balancing game of keeping an open mind for where life could exist without wasting too many resources trying to find life in extremely violent or wild uh, environments. Mike Holliday asks another question here associated with the, uh, the broader search for life. Do you coordinate your search for life with the search for extraterrestrial intelligence? Ah, uh, no, I do not. Um, SETI works with radio waves. Search for extraterrestrial intelligence is just that, search for intelligent life, which means what they're looking for is very different from what I'm looking for. I would be ecstatic to find evidence of plant life on another planet. And that's not what SETI would ever be able to find. I'm trying to, or some of my research relates to looking at a planet's atmosphere to see if there's evidence of life in that atmosphere. SETI looks for radio waves. It looks for evidence of intelligent beings that are attempting to communicate whether or, or are accidentally communicating. And so their very, very far end research goals connect to mine, but there's not a lot of collaboration that's possible except in a very cordial, ah, oh, yes, we're both interested in this kind of way. Keep tabs, you know, see what they're up to, see what we're up to. Um, but beyond that, it's hard to do detailed collaboration because the way in which we look at these systems is just very different. Okay, well, thank you. Let's see, we're getting near our prescribed more or less prescribed one hour limit. Let me ask a final question here from Stuart, who I think got us started off with an early question. Dr. Mayo, what are your thoughts on Dr. Stephen Hawking's concerns that we should not be announcing our presence to other worlds because they may come to kill us and their technology would be way more advanced than our own? That is a fascinating question. Um, I would say that Stephen Hawking is and was a genius. And if he says we should be cautious, then we should probably be cautious. Um, our ability to announce ourselves at the moment is limited. Even our strongest radio waves fall off in intensity to the point that they sort of fall into the background within a few dozen or a few hundred light years of Earth which means only a very nearby alien species would even be able to register our presence. But that being said, we do not know, first of all, if alien life exists, I'm inclined to think it does just by statistics alone. So even if it does exist, we don't know what they're like. Maybe we don't give ourselves enough credit and we sort of put our own human perspective on aliens and think they would come and kill us because we've done frankly, some of that to each other. Um, or maybe it's extremely wise that we should be careful because maybe the only aliens out there that are alive are the ones that have been the most ruthless. And I don't know what the answer is. So if a question related to our fundamental ability to survive in the universe has a question, has an answer of, I don't know, then maybe exercising caution is for the best. 
But what I would say is it's hard for us to announce our presence right now. And as we as a collective species move forward and learn more, when we attain the ability to genuinely communicate with anything that might be out there, I hope that by then we've done our due diligence and decided as a species what the wisest course of action is. I would much rather listen before speaking. Just SETI is just listening and we're just collecting light. We're just, we're absorbing information. And once we get the answers that we're looking for, are we alone in the universe? If the answer is yes, then we can turn around and assess what to do with that information. Do we want to announce our presence or not? Uh, that's a very convoluted long answer, but it's a very, very complex question. So I hope I've given you some perspective on it from, from my personal perspective. Well, regarding the danger of signaling our presence to hypothetical extraterrestrials, the rumor mill in the galaxy has it that once you've tasted humans, you never want to go back to your ordinary diet. 